So we're going to focus our attention on diatomic molecules. Diatomic molecules are molecules where we've got a mass which represents one atom connected by a spring with a force constant k and a mass m2 for the second atom. And we can show that this motion can actually be decomposed into two separate motions. We can see that we can replace it by motion of a vibrational motion of a reduced mass or an effective mass with a spring constant k plus the translation through space of a giant mass, capital M, which is equal to the individual masses by themselves. So we've got translational motion. And we can probably ignore the translational motion. We've done the free particle before, but we can look at the uh, simple harmonic oscillator right here. So what is our effective mass, our reduced mass? Well, we've seen from elementary physics, this is equal to the product of the masses over the sum of the masses. And for diatomics, this always leads to a smaller mass than either m1 or m2. That's why we refer to it as the reduced mass. We can write down the Schrodinger equation, so the uh, one-dimensional uh, time-independent uh, Schrodinger equation looks something like this. So it is minus h bar squared over 2m um, times by the second derivative with the respective position of the wave function plus v, the potential energy, times by the wave function is equal to e times the wave function. And we can go ahead and we can fill this stuff in here, so minus h bar squared over twice, we're going to look at the effective mass times by the second derivative of the wave function with respect to position, plus uh, v. Well, v we're going to go ahead and take to be 1 half kx squared. So we are making the Hooke's law potential here equals uh, e psi. So this is our Schrodinger equation. And we can rewrite that, of course, uh, h psi equals e psi. So h hat psi equals e psi. And we can take these terms here that I'm circling in green and these represent our Hamiltonian operator, and it operates on our wave function. So here we go. When we solve our Schrodinger equation, we find that we need one quantum number. That quantum number is v. v takes values from 0 to infinity in steps of 1. That's the vibrational quantum number, or vibqn for short. And the energy depends on the value we pick for v, and it's given by the expression v plus one half. So notice I put a little tail on the end of my v because we also have a nu that looks suspiciously like v. So our energy is v plus one half times by h times by nu. And uh, what is nu? Well, nu is the frequency we get from classical physics. So a mass on the end of a spring uh, vibrates with a frequency one over two pi times by the square root of the spring constant over that effective mass mu. So we have to be very careful because our nu's, that's the classical vibrational frequency, and our v, that's our vibrational quantum number, look very, very similar to each other. And just as a quick reminder here, we can go ahead and we can plot the potential energy curve versus this coordinate x. So uh, x looks something like that. It's in the center when the bond is at its normal elongation. That's our uh, classical curve here, our parabola. We can go ahead and we can sketch our energy level. So we've got uh, v uh, equals 0 here. This gives us our zero point energy because zero energy is here. And we can see at our lowest energy state, it actually has an energy bigger than zero. And then v equals 1 and 2 and 3. And so we have our ladder here where all the steps are exactly the same size. That is h times by nu, where nu is our classical fre frequency. Our wave functions are uh, interesting. They actually sneak or tunnel outside of the potential energy curve. So uh, we have this region here called tunneling. So technically at this point here, a classical oscillator could not move. If we had a ball rolling down here, we would go up and we'd reach the turning point where all the kinetic energy had gone to potential. And then we would roll down again and convert potential into kinetic until we reach the turning point, in which case we'd have all our energy and potential again. And then down here, all in kinetic, blah, 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 blah. So our wave function, right, actually penetrates outside of this region here. So this tail here is set to tunnel. If we go ahead and we sketch the other wave function, they actually do the same thing. They tunnel out into a non-classical region, and we can see the number of nodes increases. And so nodes are places where the wave function changes sign. So if I've done this right, then we have uh, our nodes as we, uh, so, so here's a node right here, where it crosses from positive to negative. And here's a couple of nodes. Here is one, two, three. So the bigger the quantum number, the more nodes it has. In fact, the quantum number itself is the number of vibrational nodes we have. 
We can work with wave numbers if we prefer. So wave numbers are defined as 1 over the wavelength. And if the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, then 1 over the wavelength is equal to the frequency over the speed of light. So if we want to go ahead and take our expression, E sub V is equal to V plus 1 half times by H nu. Well, we can go ahead now and we can say nu um, is equal to 1 over wavelength times by C. So that is our wave number times by C. And we can write that in the expression instead. So the energy depends on V, and it's given by the expression V plus a half times by H. And instead of nu, we can go ahead and replace it with nu tilde times by C. So we'll just put the C first, and then the nu tilde second. And if we want to go ahead and write an expression for nu tilde, that is equal to nu over C. So that is 1 over 2 pi times by C multiplied by the square root of k over the effective mass. We can calculate the vibrational number for the vibrational motion of a molecule like a hydrogen chloride. So we just need to know all the terms here in this expression. Some of them we can just look up, so 2 and pi and the speed of light we can look up. We need to know the force constant for HCl, and we need to calculate the reduced mass for HCl. The force constant we can look up, and uh, it is about 516 newtons per meter. And uh, the uh, reduced mass we have to calculate. So it is the mass of protium, 1H, times by the mass of chlorine 35. So this is an isotopomer we're specifying here. So we're actually going ahead and saying the specific isotopes of the atoms in our molecule. And we can look these up in the CRC handbook. So the mass of hydrogen is 1.008 atomic mass units. And chlorine 35 is 34.969. And uh, we go ahead and we add those two on the bottom. And at the end of the day, we will have units of atomic mass units. So I get that to be 0 0.9797 mu. So notice essentially the motion is just that of a hydrogen. The chlorine is so heavy during the vibration, the hydrogen really moves. The chlorine basically stays put. An atomic mass unit is 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 of a kilogram. So we can get this reduced mass in kilograms. And my math says that this is 1.6268 times 10 to the minus 27 of a kilogram. And remember, all these expressions, we are referring to individual molecules. So don't forget to use individual molecules and not molar masses. So we're ready to plug in. So new tilde is 1 over 2 pi c. So it's 1 over 2 pi uh, times pi c. So we can take c to be 2.998. Um, that is times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So meter seconds to the minus 1. But it is conventional to measure frequencies or wave numbers in reciprocal centimeters. And so we might find it easier having the speed of light in centimeters per second. We know that there's 100 centimeters in a second. So if it's 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, it'll be 2.998 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. So that just makes the math a little bit easier. And we've got our force constant. We were told it was 516 newtons per meter. And we've calculated our reduced mass to be 1.6268 times 10 to the minus 27 of a kilogram. We could go ahead and just type everything in our calculator, but we might want to make sure our units are consistent. So if we look at this fraction up front, it has units of seconds over centimeters. And if we look at the square root here, we've got newtons over meter. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. We're dividing that by meters. And then we're dividing all that by kilograms. So we can go ahead and we can check the unit cancellation here. So we've got kilograms canceling. We've got meters canceling. We've got uh, seconds squared and then square rooted. So uh, we can go ahead and we can rewrite that as seconds over centimeters. And then we've got the square root of 1 over seconds squared. So uh, if we've got the square root of 1 over seconds squared, then that is equal to 
1 over seconds, and then we can see that those 1 over seconds are going to cancel out and give us units of centimeters to the minus 1. So those are the kind of units we're looking for here. And if we go ahead and we plug everything in, we get 2990, and those are centimeters to the minus 1. And if we look at a low resolution spectrum in, say, an infrared spectrometer of HCL, what we find is that we see a strong absorption. So that's a region where we've got a low percent transmittance centered right around that frequency we just calculated. So about 2990 wave number centimeters to the minus 1. In high resolution work, what we'll actually see is a series of lines that uh, look kind of interesting. In fact, if you remember our rotational work earlier, you might recognize that we've got these lines, those cones, or comb-like structures here with constant spacing. And we'll see that this comes from the fact that not only does the molecule vibrate, it also rotates, and we can see rotational information in our spectrum too.